Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're exploring the world of computer vision. We'll talk about the role of deep learning models and how computer vision use cases are working in healthcare and the environment. To discuss that, I'm joined by Prashant Natarajan, Vice President of Strategy and Products at H2O.ai. Prashant, happy Friday to you. Thanks for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience, James. So I think I think the world of computer vision is fascinating. I want to ask you about what's happening with computer vision this year. But before that, I'd love to get kind of the backstory of computer computer vision. I know it's been going for decades, but the real breakthrough is, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, has happened fairly recently. Let's talk about what exactly is computer vision when we use that phrase. Computer, well, let's maybe before we touch upon computer vision, I think we should Please. touch upon the concept of artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. So rather than get into a debate of what artificial intelligence is, let's go with some of the common accepted definitions out there. Right, right. Even so AI, AI, I mean, I have my own definition. I'd love to hear your definition. We'll, let's go with your definition. Well, yeah, so when I think about the, the definition of artificial intelligence, I think about it, it's a, sa a software platform that can actually learn. As opposed to say, you know, I, I boot up Microsoft Word, great piece of software, but you know, the, 10,000 times in a row, I started a sentence the same way. It never figures out to help me with that sentence because it's not, it doesn't have AI built in. Whereas some are, some applications have built in, they realize that I'm, the first thing I'm gonna type always is laundry list, you know, gro grocery list. And so I type that G and it spells out grocery list for me. And then it begins to ask me, do you want eggs? Do you want milk? Do you want hamburger? So it's really interesting. It's learning what I want. That's AI, as opposed to good old fashioned, useful, dumb software. I, 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 I agree with that completely. And since you asked me, I would say that just a definition that I like a lot is uh, artificial intelligence is the ability of computers to A, think like humans. Okay. B, act like humans, whether thinking is a precursor or not. C, think logically or four, act logically. So these are the four definitions which I like because I think different AI systems do one or more of the above. Well, but I think one of those bullet points I might quibble with is think like a human. As, as we know, for example, there's, there's the Google engineer who got himself in trouble by saying that the, the Google, Google AI system is actually sentient. And Google said, no, we love our AI products, but we don't think they're actually sentient. So we're, we're thinking AI doesn't really quite think like humans. It thinks logically. It can offer intelligence, but it doesn't think like humans because we write poetry, we fall in love, we we, we disagree with ourselves. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, that AI quite thinks like humans quite yet. I, well, I, I, I would say you're absolutely right. I would qualify that, that today's AI thinks as much as humans think with all their biases, emotions, behaviors represented in data. Mm -hmm. So yes, AI doesn't have sentiments. AI I, I also think, and I don't want to be too controversial here, I think before we get to the wonderful world of artificial general intelligence, there are a lot of problems we can solve with narrow AI and symbiotic intelligence. True, true. So I would also agree with you that before we have humans, I would say, well, James, you know what, uh, I, I'd say two things. We want humans to be better humans, and we want computers to be better act or think like better humans. Right. So the way we do that is to use machine intelligence to examine the patterns of not just how we behave, but also the inherent biases that each of us have, whether that's as individuals or whether it's as communities or populations. Mm -hmm. So in the end, AI today is machine learning and deep learning on large amount of data. Right. Data is not human emotion or human behavior, love or anger. But it is the best surrogate we have in today's world of these things. Right, right. And, and still, I would claim, as advanced as it is, fairly simple by comparison to human judgment, although, of course, in some ways, it outstrips us. In terms of calculations, it far outstrips us. But in terms of some of the high-end judgment, it can open a door, but it can't tell you which door to open, and it can't tell you why maybe you want to open the door. I think we have um, a lot to you know. do that, because I think one of the key things over here I think that's still a bridge too far. Right. Because I would say the next evolution is the work that is happening in causality. Right. Causality. But let's go beyond patterns because AI today does, I would say, in many use cases, an excellent job of pattern recognition, including in computer vision. Oh, yeah. Pattern recognition is a strength. Absolutely. It's superb. Right. It's also, I would say, 
from what we are doing at H2O, we see that if you want to classify a set of entities, whether that's through whatever data science technique, we'll touch upon that, mm -hmm. or you want to forecast something, you want to predict something based on the available data and how good that data is and how interpretable the machine learning is, we are able to do a lot, right? Mm -hmm. I would say there are, the next evolution is causality because understanding patterns is one thing, understanding the causes of those patterns is something. And the third thing we are talking about, James, is then going beyond that. I even posit that things like artificial neural networks and things like that, I would say the human brain, and I've said this in many of my interviews and books, is I'd say the human brain is so complex right. that forget thinking like a human, even to create an intelligent machine that does 10% of what the human brain does is going to be a holy grail for all of us. So right. I think it's presumptuous to accept that, to, to even think that somehow emotion and the finer things of what make us human are going to be somehow done by a machine. So on one hand, I don't buy the, the dystopian view that AI is going to take all our jobs away. It's going to cause havoc. It's going to uh, give me a root canal that I don't want. No, <laughs> AI is not going to do that. Right. And AI is not going to exercise for you. It's not going to eat your bread for you. Unfortunately, I still need to run after this interview. <laughs> well, okay, so let's, let's talk about, that's AI. Computer vision in the year 2022, what are the trends driving it or holding it back th this particular year? What's happening right now with computer vision? I think there's a few things that happened. And I think the big breakthrough, I think a couple of big breakthroughs happened in computer vision. I posit that the first breakthrough that happened was actually the internet. Oh, and, okay. and why? Because the internet allowed people to post pictures and videos of their cats. Yes. And all of a sudden, the rest of us had work to do. So, so I think the availability of images, the pictures that people have taken, have contributed to this large available set of images that have really addressed a fundamental issue that we have always had, which is data. Right. So the internet, as a result of distributed contributions from various people, basically became the world's data store for computer vision. Interesting. Over and above that, you had various organizations, especially in the medical space and other spaces that have been investing, and also the software companies, right? Or right. tech companies like H2O, others, right? Uh, many right. others yeah. who have been investing in waiting for this to happen. I would say the real, the, if you go back, I would say almost 20 years, 30 years, that the earliest ANN started really performing. Um, Hinton's backprop and stuff like that. And then much later on, we have come to today's deep learning with my friend Andrew Ng and others. Right. We're able to take advantage of the data that exists out there then to put deep learning on it. And deep learning has really shown through in two areas particularly, which is computer vision and natural language processing. So we at H2O are using a combination of deep learning and machine learning quite a bit and a lot of our computer vision and NLP is deep learning based obviously because that's where it excels. The third thing that has happened this year, I think particularly 2022 is a big year because it's the year of pre-trained models. And pre it's pre-trained models. Pre -trained pre models. Okay, all right. The year of pre-trained models because what has happened, I would say if you go back to say 20 years, James, the internet and then a lot of deep learning, let's be generous and say 10 years ago. So every 10 years, right, we are in the third cycle of the, the decade we are entering, the new decade, right. where people have been able to take images, which are freely available today, much more so. People are able to take annotated images and corrections to those images, right. which creates the fundamental training data set that you sometimes need. Mm -hmm. or, or the third thing, which is very important is people are now involving themselves in feedback mechanisms and feedback loops to not just provide feedback on the images themselves, but also the open source community, which is coming together in wonderful ways that we are also driving a lot of those innovations mm -hmm. is really enabled to put that to work. So all of those together have resulted now in data, distributed computing and distributed storage and data science coming together 
Now for people to be able to take starting models that have come out of industrial shops and academic research and medical informatics, and to be able to extend those quickly for new use cases in ways that were impossible. So you no longer need if you want to do something interesting, James, it's not like you had to first find storage. You had to find GPU then. Then you had to go find something else. All of that has been simplified today. So 2022 is, and it's not just me. I've also talked to the computer vision experts, yes. at Joe, Philip, and Dimitri, and others, and they're all excited. And hence, our investment has also been in a lot of the infrastructure to support that trend, which we think is, again, going to be a game-changing trend in this decade in computer vision. It, it clearly seems so. All right, well, let's, you, you, may, you mentioned it, H2O. Let's, let's drill down. You know, what is the H2O.AI advantage? Why do customers go to it? What, what does the company offer them that might be different from competitors? I think uh, H2O, I think for, first is a, it's our ethos, right? We believe strongly that technology must serve a greater good. Yes, it must also create operating efficiencies. Yes, it must also you know, do the various things we want businesses to do because a lot of our customers are the world's leading companies, uh, banks, insurance companies, healthcare organizations. Let me interrupt you if, if, if I may, in terms of maybe we'll get a broader thing. Like if I think about H2O.AI, do I think of it as a consultancy? Do I think of it as someone who codes a lot of new software? Is, is it a platforming? What, what, what literally is the company in that sense? But I also want to get into the advantages. We are the most comprehensive and popular AI platform. And we both on the cloud and on press. Why do I say that? Because we have thousands of organizations in the world using H2. We have hundreds of thousands of models in production today that are influencing various aspects of life. Mm -hmm. We are a product company. We are a product company. We are not a services company. We are not a consulting shop. We are not an advisory company. We create the products that data scientists, chief analytics officers and chief data officers, and most importantly, business leaders use mm -hmm. to transform their organizations and transform their teams. Well, now, right. in order to do that, we yeah. also provide the expertise that we have in the AI transformation that we have collaborated with various organizations to truly make these organizations also AI powered organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well then what about those people who go, you know, we're, we're having the AI wars now, like who's gonna be the, the leading providers of AI? Some people say, it's gonna be the cloud platforms. People are gonna to go to AWS to get their, their AI you know, software and, and services what, what, is, what does an executive at H2O say about that? Uh, we say let a thousand flowers bloom because out of that will come the best bouquet. Oh, okay. because, right. because I think we have to encourage the rising tide will rise all ships in the harbor. Yes. We believe that the customers who are on our ship will rise much higher than everybody else. Of okay. course, I believe that. I work for H2O. I'm proud of what <laughs> our team does. I'm proud of our ethos. Yeah. Having said that, we do not take a point of view. In order for H2O to do well, others don't have to lose. Yeah. Because a client would still need the cloud for certain reasons. If mm -hmm. it is a regulated customer or government, they may need an air gap cloud or an on-premise environment. Right, if it right. is medical imaging, you're not going to send every single medical imaging from your DICOM server to the cloud just because you want to be popular with the cool kids. So <laughs> we don't care almost where the data resides. We believe for AI to be successful, data has gravity. Yes. And AI and ML and deep learning must meet data where it is, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, we want everybody, we want this innovation ecosystem, we want business leaders we want people to try various things out. But the only thing is to make it easier for them. We'll say, go with people who have a demonstrator track record versus the people who have just created their PowerPoint slides three years ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting. All right. So uh, it's a lot of good stuff about HCO and, and AI. I love looking into the future because I think when it comes to AI and, and deep learning and computer vision, people are always thinking about the future because big things we are told are coming in the future. 
What, what do you see if you look into so oh the, the middle of the decade or so maybe 2025 or thereabouts what's going to be happening with, with computer vision that year or or, or, or so or right in there uh, talking talking to my colleagues james i think one of the few of the things that we are seeing very clearly is number one the access to these pre-trained models which we touched upon earlier is going to create new customizable data science assets and AI applications and AI app stores, specifically in the CV, sorry, computer vision space, that are going to drive not just transformational initiatives, but more importantly, commerce, mm. right? So I would say that the thing that we are most excited about, my colleagues and I, and I'm most excited about, is a world where computer vision, I think in about three years time, maybe even sooner is going to be in a place where you're going to have easy access to tools and products that allow you to scale deep learning without all of the challenges of storage and compute and data and annotation and tools and technology that people have had. We believe strongly that that will also lead to the democratization of AI and the democratization of CV. Because when people have access to all the tools, then they can truly focus on solving the problems they want to solve as opposed to hunting. It's almost like I would say human existence going from the hunter-gatherer's existence to my existence today, sitting on the couch, eating chips and drinking <laughs> soda, right? I like it. Don't get me wrong. I take this over hunter-gatherer. Right. But what I would say is we'll be getting now to a period of riches on applications and commerce that we were never able to do. CV has been, up until so far, largely the area of advanced research and really a place where the research was needed for us to put those applications at work. I, I see that in 10 years from now, to look at the upper end of your time limit, we would be we would be in a world where the commerce around computer vision would be far exceeding the commerce around AI today. Around AI? Wow, okay, that's a big prediction. So actually the computer vision as, as a subsector is actually gonna outstrip artificial intelligence itself. Yeah, and I would say one, you, you don't have to believe me, you just have to see how many people are taking selfies, how many people are doing TikTok videos. What, what they haven't figured out other than tagging themselves is how to monetize it, how right. to use it to create journeys, how to use it to create experiences. Right. When we are able to bring CV into play and AI into play to be able to truly democratize it, right? We want computer vision to be as accessible as an app on a phone that anybody can use, right? right. So, so there should be tools where, frankly speaking, you fill in the answers and you place it on your table. Your child goes home, it's graded and it's available. And you know, you can all feel proud about how well your kid has done, <laughs> right? So that is what I really see happening. And the amount that we interact with visual cues and visual products and visual experiences in our life far exceeds that of text. So I would frankly, put it right out there that this is my personal opinion that the commerce around cv in 10 years is going to be exceeding the commerce around ai today that's pretty fascinating okay that's a, that's an interesting prediction um and is, is part of that uh you know what as you're talking i thought about the idea of low code no code is is, is part of what's driving that the democratization low code or no code or not necessarily in terms of your context so i think there's two things over here we are with uh, with our with the work that we are doing on our platform on Hydrogen Torch, for example, from H2O, we are providing the tools to be able to help data scientists and computer vision engineers scale what they are doing and to come up with better products, to come up with better models, and to, to really put their expertise to bear without worrying about the things that they've had to worry about. But on the other hand, that's one side of it, right? The other side of it is, in order, our mission is to democratize AI, right? So if you want to democratize AI, we have to go to every member of our community 
and I don't say customers because it's community. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work, for example, our team in doing in wildfire prediction and wildlife conservation, working with some of the top organizations in healthcare, mm -hmm. we feel that we are part of a community. Of course we are, but we believe that we have a duty and responsibility. So the AI for good ethos that Sri Satish and H2O have been doing for many years, takes the innovations we are doing in computer vision, natural language processing. While we help businesses succeed and transform themselves with AI, we are also doing work on seafloor mapping, and wildlife prediction in a lot of things. Let's make sure we, do, we get that. I, I, I don't want us to leave. We should we should wrap up. I, let's let's touch on the, the, the environment stuff and then the healthcare stuff. Okay. Let, please, please explain the details. Yeah. So I'd say let's go to the environment stuff first. So I think one of the things that we are doing right now is we are involved with some of the world's leading companies um, across the world um, uh, in taking a look at a threat that we all have now. Uh, it's the time of the year. Australia is going to go into bushfire season. Mm. Various parts of the United States are going to go into wildfire season. And the amount of damage destruction is just tremendous. Um, and so one of the things that we have been doing is, again, you, you asked the question about what can we do? So we take these data science innovations that we are doing for our commercial customers, right? And we have created, we have opened up that platform, James, to data scientists and data engineers and communities around the world to actually create their own prediction models using the H2O platform and then decide also how they should put that models to bear. What applications can they build around it? Mm -hmm. And can they build a model and then use that model to connect to services and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So in order to be able to do all of that, first you should have the underlying machine learning and deep learning working. Yeah. Just think about the possibilities now, right? Uh, in that particular use case, one of the things we are talking about is looking at CV, for example, the competition doesn't have that now, but we want to be able to take advantage of the thousands of satellites that exist above us and to be able to take that imaging and to be able to use a mix of historical data, pattern recognition, climatic data, which is seasonality, time series data, which is episodic, and now layer CV data on that to actually save lives, save property, et cetera. Gotcha. One of uh, the Ohio State University and our collaborators there are also doing some very interesting work with H2O in wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, uh, you know, we started our conversation with a comment about Winston Churchill from right. about 100 years ago. Right. And if you think about it, at that time, forests actually meant something because it meant that you actually went and discovered and explored something, right? right? It, it actually meant something when Livingstone went to Africa or, sure. no, or Vasco da Gama yeah. came to India. Right. Uh, today, we have explorers and the more number of pictures of animals are taken by tourists with selfies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in large parts of Africa <laughs> right, because right, of the number of national parks because tourism has become the way to keep wildlife conservation today alive yeah yeah because right. of all the other pressures right. so instead of instead of just cursing tourists why can't we take advantage of the selfies that people are uploading yes to identify animals that need protection to identify uh -huh. Uh -huh. the traffic patterns, to identify, for example, diseased populations and population reduction. Yes. So we are working with our partners to do that. And then a, a quickie, and we have to go pretty soon, but a quickie on, on healthcare and NAI, was it, or, or computer vision, what, what, what's the details on that one? Healthcare is a passion uh, for us as a company, as a company H2O was founded based on a healthcare use case. Not many, okay. many people know this actually. Okay. Uh, maybe Sri can talk about that at length in the future conversation. Uh, it's a, definitely a personal passion for me. One of the interesting things we are doing is as a result of the COVID crisis, we have been looking at COVID data, for example, to predict hospital capacity. Hmm. And also to look at supply chain and HR implications on nurses and doctors. Hmm. The solution is live at 55 hospitals, uh, James, uh -huh. for okay. last almost one year, uh -huh. uh, where actually people are putting it to work. So when people say, oh, AI didn't work during COVID, um, maybe you're talking to the wrong people. Come and talk to us at H2O. We'll actually introduce you to the people who have made AI work during COVID. Hmm. Um, I would say the other thing in the computer vision context is uh, uh, disease detection. We have been working on ch chest abnormality detection that we built with Hydrogen Torch, which can provide 
not a clinical decision support system, but a clinical aid for radiologists right. to use AI sure. and set thresholds to identify one among 14 diseases. What we say very clearly is the AI that we do is not a clinician. So you still need a clinician to validate of and put in practice, yes. but we are able to do that with very high accuracy today. And that's that's these things we will see. Our ethos of saving lives and contributing to the community will continue through these initiatives. Prashant, I think you said it. It is it's a fascinating sector. It's a fascinating series of emerging technologies. Uh, let's keep track in the years ahead. Thanks so much for sharing your insight today. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.